policy, the district policy. There's district policy around citizens' comments just so that we can ensure that it's orderly and that we do it um, from an um, asset-driven perspective, and that's policy uh, 2370. So we ask that, um, actually, yeah. So we ask that you please pull that up. The individuals are to, first of all, state your name and then your residence, and then you have three minutes to speak. Uh, cannot be mentioned of specific personnel and direct uh, name use perspective. However, we are very interested in hearing your comments. We ask that if there are any personnel uh, staff members here and you have an issue that you follow uh, district uh, organizational protocol and to meet first with your principal and then if there's issues then to go before the uh, superintendent and then before the board that personnel matters should not be discussed by staff. Thank you so much. I also, before we continue, as individuals come to the microphone, we want to acknowledge our participation in government students. Let's give them a hand for being here. And would you all please stand up? Participation in government students. There you go. Wonderful. At this time, uh, citizens that would like to come to the microphone. There being none, we're going to move into our superintendent's uh, report. So good evening, everyone. Um, one of the things, and do we have any, okay. I'm going to walk up to the, the actual podium because I will be providing a report or an update on the district's financial accountability and some of the things that we're putting into place to address some of the recent audit findings. And I will be presenting for about 20 to 30 minutes. So I want to thank everyone for being here. This is a very important meeting in that the information that you'll be provided with this evening is information that is going to really shed some light on some of the challenges that the Poughkeepsie City School District has faced in its recent years. As everyone is aware, I became superintendent on August 5th of this year. What I've been doing since I have come on board is really looking at our entire system from A to Z. That's inclusive of our business operations and our finances. I have also received the assistance of the Comptroller's Office, who has conducted a number of audits on various areas of our organization. And those audits, while they have yielded information that any organization would not necessarily be too proud of, I will share with you that it was good to see information early on for me to be able to then begin addressing some of the issues that have been outlined in the audit report. So the presentation is in broken up into three different sections. I want to talk a little bit about responsibility, and the responsibility section really pertains to what our board policy speaks to as it relates to the responsibility of our Board of Education related to the financial management of the district, the re responsibility of the superintendent as it relates to the financial management of the district, and also the responsibility of the financial official who is an employee of the district as it relates to the financial management. I will then provide everyone in one concise place the findings, the key findings of the Comptroller's audit reports, things that have been published, things that have already been placed on our website, things that have been covered by our local media. I will also present to you our external audit findings, which is also on our website. But more importantly, I will share with you what we are doing as a school district to address our financial state. More specifically, how are we going to hold ourselves accountable 
for the taxpayer dollars that we receive and the other financial resources that we receive as a district. So when we look at the responsibilities of the board, the board has a number of different responsibilities, as does the superintendent. However, I want to highlight some of the things that the board is responsible for. And the reason why I want to take us through this exercise is to make sure that people have a clear understanding of what the board's responsibilities are, what the superintendent's responsibility are, and then, of course, individuals who report to me what their responsibilities are as it relates to the financial management of the district. So, of course, we all understand that the board has the responsibility of hiring the superintendent. They have the, op they have the responsibility of policy development. And they also have the, op the responsibility of the financial management of the district. However, as you peel back the layers of the onion and you go down to the superintendent, the superintendent also has responsibilities. And as I've stated, the business official also has op responsibilities. So here, develop and adopt written policies in all areas of the school district, governance and operations in order to provide direction to staff and students and information to the community. As I mentioned, they also have the responsibility of hiring an educational leader to serve as superintendent of schools, adopt a description of his or her professional duties and provisions for performance evaluation, as well as retention or removal from the position based on those evaluations and contractual obligations. In the area of fiscal management, the board has the responsibility of approving the budget and spending priorities. At the same time, seek to ensure adequate local, state, and federal revenues to support the budget. They have the responsibility of approving construction projects, capital expenditures, contracts, and budget reports within a framework of policy and delegated authority suitable for the board. Systematically link policies and decisions regarding allocation of funds with curriculum instruction and desired learning outcomes. In the area of contracts, the board has the responsibility of approving contracts and ensuring the execution of the contracts. The superintendent of schools or his or her designee shall present information to the board for discussion and enable the board to make an informed decision regarding contracts to be executed. Superintendent of schools. The board shall appoint a superintendent of schools who shall enforce the statutes, administrative codes, and the policies and regulations adopted by the board. Superintendent of schools, of course, has many responsibilities. And I'll jump down to the financial management to prepare and present to the board a preliminary annual budget in accordance with a schedule established with the board. He, she is responsible for ensuring that the budget as adopted by the board and approved at the annual meeting is properly administered. Let me repeat that. He, she is responsible for ensuring that the budget as adopted by the board and approved at the annual meeting is properly administered. He or she shall ensure that regular reports are made to the board on the status of the budget. He or she is also responsible for establishing efficient procedures to maximize income, safeguard investments, and provide effective controls for all expenditures of school funds in accordance with the adopted budget. He or she shall ensure that all necessary bookkeeping and accounting records are maintained by the district. Management of functions, which basically speaks to my responsibility as superintendent to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the school district, which is also inclusive of, of course, managing the financial day-to-day -day operations. In every school district, there is a person who is responsible for the financial office. In our school district, we have the title as Assistant Superintendent for Business and Operations. This person's responsibility is to advance the educational opportunity through the management of district business affairs, to provide equipment and facilities required for the comfort, convenience, and performance of the educational staff and student body, to conduct the business office as a service organization to the district, and to serve in an advisory capacity to the superintendent. 
Some of their duties include direct the business affairs of the school system in compliance with the instruction of the superintendent, pertinent laws, and board of education policies. Oversee financial planning and budgeting for the district. Perform or supervise internal audits and carry out recommendations of official audits. Supervise expenditures as authorized by the district budget in accordance with the district purchasing procedures. Prepare specifications and bids as needed. Process orders and recommended payment following delivery of goods and services. Provide district storage and delivery. Carrying out the responsibilities of the district purchasing agent. Establish and supervise accounting, bookkeeping, payroll, reporting, cost analyses. Organize and supervise inventory of school property. Administer the insurance program and records. Administer the district income and investment program. Recommend board policies to the superintendent. Ensure effective communication among business office personnel. So I have taken the time to share this with everyone because it's a very important that when you think about the financial responsibility of an organization such as the school district, that there are three major layers. The board, the board has the responsibility of approving the budget. The board has the responsibility of approving or deliberating on recommendations that the superintendent makes the superintendent has the responsibility of making sure that anything that the board needs to approve, that the superintendent has done his or her due diligence with making sure that it does not impact, adversely impact that is, the school district. The business official, in partnership with the superintendent, has the responsibility of making sure that from A to Z, Everything that should be happening in the business office is happening in a way that is following policy, making sure that all the pertinent laws, be them local, state, or federal laws, are being met, and making sure that as a school district, we are operating in a way that's going to be a benefit ultimately to our children, but also a benefit to our community as well. So, as I mentioned, there's been a number of audits that have come out, and I've had conversations with the Poughkeepsie Journal, the Mid-Hudson News, on my response to this information that's being presented to, to myself, as well as the Board of Education. And as I opened up, I share it with you that while the information has not been good in any light, it has really pointed out a number of things that have not taken place in the district, it has pointed out a lot of things that have been dysfunctional in the district, it has pointed out a lot of things that need to be addressed in the district. For me, as a new superintendent coming in, while the information has not been something that, that I've been excited you know, to hear about, I do appreciate the Comptroller's audits because it's provided me with a good understanding of what needs to be addressed so that we can turn our school district around and begin operating much more effectively and much more efficiently with meeting the needs of our children. So the first audit that came out, in fact, it was my first day on the job. I was called into the, um, the conference room to meet with the auditors. And they shared with me their key findings for extra classroom activity, as well as information technology assets. What I learned was that student treasurers and faculty advisors did not maintain adequate supporting documentation for 25 deposits totaling $37,000. I also learned that the central treasurer did not prepare timely reports for the board or auditor. I also learned that IT assets valued at $11,000 were not included on the inventory list and could not be located. So my first question, as many of your first questions would be, was like, okay, when did this take place? Is this something that happened this past year? Is this something that is occurring? What sort of things have been put into place to address these issues were my first question. 
The response, of course, was that while the audit was provided to us in September, actually August, it was published in September, that this audit period of July 1st, 2016, through July 18th, 2018, is when these findings refer to. And in fact, even with this audit here, the audit period was extended back to January 1st, 2007, to review the extra classroom activity and the equipment donations. So as I begin to, to ask those people who are around the table, along with um, the auditors, this information is coming to us, and for what I see, this information is lag data. <clears throat> the question that I have, being that it's lag data, is it things that are still happening? And of course, what will share it with me that some things are still occurring, however, many of the things that have been outlined in the audit have been addressed or are being addressed. The next meeting I was invited to was in October where we discussed our budgeting. It was shared with me that the appropriations were overestimated, resulting in operating surplus of $6.2 million in 2016-2017. Scratch my head and says, wow, that's a lot of money that we have in surplus. It doesn't match what I'm looking at when it comes to our current financial books. District officials made excessive year-end budget transfers in 2016-2017 and 2017-2018 without board approval. I asked the question, are those individuals still here? The response was, many of them are not. And those who are here are individuals who are what I consider to be worker bees who process at a supervisor or a director's direction. The district had unrestricted funds totaling 10.6 million and 12 million at the end of the 2016 and 2017, 18 school year respectively, which exceeded statutory limits of 3.9 million and 4 million. Once again, when I looked at our budgets, we don't have that type of money that is in our reserves. And that was explainable because as you can see throughout here, is that the audit period is from July 2016 through July 18, 2018. So it covers a span of time that doesn't necessarily reflect the present. And once again, the audit period was extended as well for this. Payroll, meeting I was called to in November to meet with our state comptroller's office indicated collective bargaining agreements are not comprehensive and payroll and personnel policies are outdated. And I will share with you that our contracts with our teachers, our contracts with our administrators, our contracts with our clerical unit, our contracts with CSEA, they're all outdated. Many of our collective bargaining agreements have been working without a new contract, which we are currently in discussions with some collective bargaining units right now. And when it comes to our personnel department, looking at some of our policies and our protocols, they're extremely antiquated and they need to change and they are changing. 11 retirees received payments that they were not eligible for, totaling $27,000 for not participating in the health insurance program. In addition, five received Medicare Part B reimbursements, totaling $10,000 that were not, they were not eligible for. So let me pause real quick and sort of take you on a journey. If we are all a part of an organization and we see a lot of turnover and there are people who are coming in and out of the district, and for those of you who have been a part of many of my fireside chats, I talk about the high turnover rate that Poughkeepsie City Schools has experienced for years, it, it will have an impact. And what, I find, what I'm finding is that that impact is actually resulting in individuals who are walking into a new job, who are working to do their best in the new job without necessarily having the institutional knowledge, 
opportunities for professional development for them to learn the job or what I consider to have a playbook for them to be able to refer to when it comes to understanding what they should be doing. And as a result, there's been some things that have happened in our school district that none of us are proud of and that we are correcting. Four maintenance workers were paid a total of $26,000 for roughly 170 days of accrued leave above the carryover limit without board approval. The audit speaks to it. Can't deny it. It happened. What can we do to improve? And I'll be speaking to that in a few moments. Procurement claims auditing. The board did not, and this is why I wanted to make sure that in the beginning I talked about responsibilities, because the audit report indicates that the board did not seek competitive, seek competition, excuse me, for professional services totaling approximately $1.6 million or competitively bid purchase in public works contracts totaling approximately $6.1 million during the audit period of 2016 through 2018. Keep in mind, the board approves recommendations that are brought forward by the superintendent. This is the superintendent's responsibility to make sure that he or she is doing their due diligence with making sure that the day-to-day -day operations, the policies, the protocols are all being followed. It also indicates that the board did not have written agreements with nine professional service providers paid a total of $968,000 during the audit period. Once again, the responsibility of the superintendent is to make sure that whatever is being presented to the board is following board policy, appropriate laws, et cetera. The director of technology circumvented the procurement policy and ordered various items online totaling $71,000 during the audit period, including roughly $4,500 for shipping costs. Now, in our school district, no one has a purchasing card. Well, let me, let me pause. There's a few people who have a purchasing card. Our board clerk, no one else has a purchasing card. In order for our director of technology to purchase something, there needs to be the establishment of a purchase order for any item to be purchased. The way this is written gives the impression that our director of technology purposely circumvented an established protocol. What took place in this situation is that our director of technology seeking to provide the supports to our classroom teachers and other staff members requested POs as the person should have and those POs were issued that ne not necessarily were in compliance with protocol. Why did that happen? A lack of professional development, a lack of support, too many individuals coming in and out of our organization. So <clears throat> those were the, the controller's audit's <coughs> findings. Each year, we're required by law to make sure that we're providing an internal audit, an audit of our books for, for you know, this past year. So this past year, we had our auditors, our external auditors, conduct their audit on the financial statements and supplementary information. What they found, and I'm not gonna read all of these, and let me just say this as well, that this presentation will be placed online for people to consume. And if you would like copies of it, you can most certainly call down to our board clerk who will most certainly print out a copy for you. But what I will point out is that the audit found that there's a number of areas in which we as a school district need to focus on, which is the purpose of an audit. There are very few organizations who have a crystal clear audit meaning that they receive all green check marks saying that they did everything right. In an organization as comprehensive as a school district, particularly a school district with a $105 million operating budget, there are going to be some mistakes that are made. 
Now, am I saying that those mistakes are permissible? No, I would never say that. But with anything, there will be mistakes that are made. And the audits, rightfully so, picked up on those mistakes. So let me just point out a couple things. Control procedures for adjusting journal entries. During the audit period, it was noted that the district does maintain records and supporting documents of adjustment. There was visual support to show that the records were reviewed by different individuals in the district. That's one of those green check marks, did it right. The audit also reported that when it comes to long outstanding checks, during the audit period, it was noted that there were six checks outstanding totally approxi totaling approximately $1,000. Another audit finding found that extra classroom disbursement. During the audit period, two instances were noted where the payment order was not properly authorized, meaning that we didn't have a student sign off on a deposit and we didn't have a, a teacher sign off on the deposit. The audit also indicated that purchase order procedure, that during the audit period, it was noted that there were 11 instances of deviation from the established procedure, whereas the year before, there were five, 15 <coughs> findings. So that means that this past year, there were 11, the previous year, there were 15. Summer food program budget. During the audit period, it was noted that the district has been budgeting for expenses related to the school food program for the fiscal year preceding the year in which the expenses occur. This previous year finding indicated the same, which essentially means that for the 2019 summer program, we actually budgeted for that in the 2018. And because our fiscal year starts July 1st, it is not permissible to budget for something in a previous school year that will then be used for the school year that is coming up. Trust and agency. During the audit period, it was noted that the athletics program deposits were in excess of the cash in the bank, which in previous years was a challenge because we had actually more money that was going out than we had in the bank. This past year, that was corrected. Accounts payable. During the audit period, it was noted that the district method of recording accounts payable at le a year end is not consistent. There has been no change from the last year's finding. It's the area in which I need to focus on the superintendent. Medical billing. During the audit period, it was noted that the district's billing for Medicaid has improved, excuse me, improved compared to prior years. During the 2017 audit, it was noted that the district only billed for five months. We're in operation for 10 months. However, keep in mind that this happened in 2017. In 2018, 2019, it had improved. So we're not, we're actually billing accordingly. Billing and health services. During the audit period, it was noted that the district is up to date in the health service billing. Previous findings indicated that the district failed to bill for 2016 and 17 with outstanding billings questions for 2015. So back in 2016, 2017, the district failed to bill at all. This past year we billed, which is a good thing because we're receiving all the financial resources we need. But there were some questions in 2017 that were related to 2015 that were still outstanding. But in this year's audit, it indicated that all billings have been up to date and the district has received all the funding that it should. Now, I take us through this to share with you that as a school district, <coughs> we have some challenges. I will always be as transparent as required to make sure our community has an understanding of our challenges as a school district. I have always operated under a full transparent model because the more you share with people where you're at, the more people will understand. They may not like it, 
but the more people will understand other challenges that exist, which may or may not result in added support to help correct the challenges. So my synthesis of analysis to the challenges that we have as a school district are because for several years here in the Poughkeepsie City School District, there has been district as well as school level turbulence. And I don't need to go into a lot of the history because you guys know the history in some cases better than me. But because of that turbulence, there have been individuals who have not been able to focus on making sure that we as a school district are moving in the right direction in a way that is going to be best for our children. There's been a lack of leadership and oversight. Can't deny that. If there was leadership and oversight, people being held accountable, sticking to process and procedures, then many of the findings that we were dinged for, for things that happened in past years, and even last year, wouldn't be an issue. As I mentioned, there's been significant turnover in positions key to the operations of the finance and business office. We've had significant leadership loss in our finance office. Outdated protocols and policies. There are things that are being brought to my attention as I'm doing my analysis from A to Z that I'm scratching my head and I'm like, okay. I remember us doing that in Buffalo, New York back in 2001. And here we are 2020 and some of the things that exist are antiquated. Lack of adherence to board policies and protocols. Now, none of this is intentional because everyone that works for the Poughkeepsie City School District, particularly in central office, are very committed to doing what's right. But if they are unaware of the protocols, the policies, if there's no game book, if there's no playbook, then people are working and operating in a way that they see best and sometimes is not the proper way. Lack of professional development, and this exists across the district. So when I ask the question of staff as I'm talking to them or speaking with them, I ask the question like, what sort of ongoing professional development do you receive? And many of them say that, you know, I was handed keys to an office, you know, I was shown where my desk was, I was shown where my desk was, sat down and I was told to do A, B, or C, and that was really the extent of things. For us to really turn our school district around, staff need to be provided with ongoing professional development and coaching. Lack of succession planning. So whenever someone leaves, as I mentioned earlier, there's never a game book that many people have to their avail to be able to say, okay, now that I'm in this role, these are the things I do. They're usually being told by other individuals, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. But there's nothing that's been written to sort of serve as a protocol on how to get things done. Now, does that mean that we don't have written protocol? No, we have written protocol. But sometimes when people are leaving, they may be on their computer, their computer has a password to it, and then we don't have access to it. So one of the things that we're gonna be working on is making sure that in every department, particularly our business office, that we have set protocols that there is a handbook where people can refer to when they're stepping into new roles. So let me talk a little bit about the corrective action because this is really the meat and potatoes of this presentation. And what I want to make sure that our community, our taxpayers, our staff, who are entrusting us as an organization to be able to operate in a way that does not hurt children, it does not misuse taxpayer dollars, and it makes sure that we have funding and supports available to our staff who come to work every day to meet the needs of our children. So, of course, what's a given is that we had adopted the key recommendations of the auditors. It is what it is, as I stated earlier. There's no way to deny it. There's no way to simply say, well, maybe they looked at something totally wrong. 
The audit findings are the audit findings, and we need to be responsive to those findings. Analyzing the business office and finance protocols. As I mentioned, a part of my work has been looking at the district from A to Z. That's inclusive of looking at our business practices and making sure that wherever I discover something that doesn't sound right or look right, then I'm addressing it. On my first day of work, I was approached by a member of the business office who had done this for years. I'm not, not you know, saying anything that is disparaging of the individual. They came to me and they simply said, you know, Dr. Rosser, we need you to sign off on this documentation that's going to state ed. And I says, well, understanding that you are an employee of the district, you know, number one, I don't know your name. Secondly, you know, I need to get an understanding as to who served as a checks and balance to this document. Have you shared this document with the assistant superintendent of business and finance? The question was, no, we, I, I never have. The superintendent just normally signs off. My response to that individual, no disrespect intended, but the way I operate is that I need to make sure that there are checks and balances in place because if I'm signing off some, on something that goes to the state, I need to have a second set of eyes look at it. More importantly, I need to have my assistant superintendent, a business who ultimately has the responsibility of the financial operations, the day-to-day -day of the, the school district. So that was something that was immediately changed. And that was on my first day. Repairing broken protocols, just mentioned that, creating new protocols. So over the break, and I was looking at these audit reports a little bit more in depth, um, I was really taking notes on different things that needed to be done. One of the audit reports our findings, excuse me, and it's, it was listed up there, indicated that our HR department for several years now has not properly recorded a number of different important data points for employees. I immediately simply said, okay, this is low hanging fruit. The only thing that I need to do is create a document that will provide us with position control, number one, so that the superintendent is not making recommendations to the board to approve adding in a position that may not be in the budget, and also capturing essential information that our auditors indicated that our HR department should have. So that's an example of me creating a new protocol so that we as a school district can operate much more effectively and efficiently. Documenting our processes, as I mentioned before, every department where there's a major process that particularly have a financial implication, it will be documented. Updating our policies. Our board and I have been discussing some of our policies, and some of our policies date back to the early 90s. And when you think about a school district, when you think about the state of education, when you think about the laws commissioner's regulations that have been created or changed, it's important that we as a school district also work to update our policies. So the board and I have been looking at ways in which we can work to update our policies in the most efficient manner. And if you look at our policy book, it's pretty thick. And there's a lot of information that we need to, to go through to update. And as I have to say that our policies serve as our guidance for how we as a school district should operate. Reviewing the functions of the business office and staff. So a part of my work has been to really look at how are we operating as a school district? Are we operating the most effective as we can? Are we operating the most efficiently? And the, the answer to that question is, is easily a no. We have not been operating as effectively or as efficiently as we, we need to. So in looking at our business office, it's important for me to make sure that when it comes to our, our business office, the function of our business office, that there's clarity around the function of our business office. So we're redefining our business office. As I share it with you, the Assistant Superintendent of Finance and, and Operations has been responsible for 
not only the financial side of the house, the person has also been responsible for elements of the operations, meaning they've been responsible for transportation, they've been responsible for facilities, they've been responsible for food service. And when you look at our school district, particularly some of the financial challenges that we've experienced in the audit reports, and also our facilities, the condition of our facilities, it is important to sort of take a second look at that and say, is this the model that's going to be most conducive to getting us where we need to go? And I will share with you that my belief as superintendent is that our current model of having our business official also responsible for those other elements of operations is not the most conducive at this point in time of our school district. And the reason why that is is because as we all are sitting in here, many of you have on your outdoor gear because it's freezing in here, which means that we have some issues with the heat here. If I have challenges in a school and the business official who should be focused on the financial operations of the district is pulled away to focus on other things, then it's quite expected that there's going to be some things that don't receive its full attention. So one of the things that the board and I have decided is that we were going to remove those other responsibilities from our business person and have someone who is purely focused on the finances and the business operation of our school district. That is the only way that we're going to be able to address some of the long-standing issues that we have had in our district. Assessing the appropriateness of other positions and titles. So for me, it's really looking at the entire pie and looking to see whether or not in our business office we have the most appropriate titles, we have the most appropriate individuals and skills working in that office. Because we need to make sure that when it comes to our financial management, which I call the fuel of our organization, something that allows us to move forward and do things with our staff and our staff working with children, we need to make sure that that office is really glowing and it's extremely effective and efficient in what it's doing. Reassigning duties where best appropriate. So just actually yesterday, it was brought to my attention that there was a business function that was outside of the business office. Once I learned it, simply shot an email to the necessary leaders to simply say that we need to make this switch because if it's business related, it should be in the business office. Because if it's not, then there's a disconnect there. And we all know that whenever there's a disconnect, that there may be the potential for mismanagement. Providing professional development to staff. This is something that, as I mentioned before, needs to happen. It needs to happen like yesterday. And I'm working to identify ways and opportunities to make sure that all of our staff are trained and receive the, the professional learning that they need in order to be most effective in their job. And then, of course, the monthly finance reporting. So when I was engaged in the interview process, looking all online for different information to get a clear understanding of the district's finances, when I came on board, I was asking for district financial reports and was provided with information. However, the information didn't really give me clarity as to what our finances look like from month to month. As a part of policy, and let me not even talk about policy, as a part of best practice, it's always good to be able to look at your bank account to simply say, okay, I have this much revenue coming in, I have this much expenses going out. We haven't, as a school district, in quite some time, provided monthly finance updates 
that's going to happen. I've already established a monthly calendar for those presentations to take place. So these are the things that I, as superintendent, am able to do. However, because I also am a member of the Board of Education, I'm not a voting member, but I am, a member of the I am the member of the Board of Education, I also have the opportunity to make recommendations to our board. And one of the recommendations that I'm making, which I think will go a long way for the management of our finances, as well as the transparency of what we're doing as a school district, is exploring the establishment of a financial advisory committee. And there are school districts across the country that have established financial advisory committees. And while there's been many purposes for school districts across the country, one of the things that I thought would be a great idea, and of course this is something that the board and I are still discussing so it's not solidified at this point in time, is to have a financial advisory committee that will serve as a resource and provide technical expertise, advice, recommendations, and support to the Board of Education and Administration in evaluating, guiding, and improving the overall fiscal condition of the district. This includes a regular review of the budget, any proposals or issues that might have a significant impact on district projects. The committee would also advise the Board of Education and Administration on internal and external audits, policy changes, development, referendums, financial project projections, and finance-related bid specifications. Now, I share this for, with you just to share with you some of the things a finance advisory committee can do. As I mentioned, the board and I are still having conversations around what this might look like for the district. The committee could be made up of board members, myself, the chief finance and business official, local government financial officials, and qualified community members. And this provides an opportunity for members of our community to be a part of important conversations related to our financial state. In addition, by having local government financial officials to be a part of the committee, it provides an opportunity for us to be able to look at opportunities to align resources to cut costs. So let me share with you in Buffalo, there was an ad hoc committee that was put together and I served on it and it was a committee of administrators, central office administrators who would meet occasionally with the city officials. And what we were able to realize or opportunities where in the event that the city of Buffalo is looking to purchase A, B, or C, and the school district is looking to purchase A, B, or C, it provides us with an opportunity to get a better cost or a better rate for purchasing it together. So this is the, one of the reasons why it's important to also have local government to be a part of it because there may be opportunities for each organization to save money taxpayer money. So this is what the board and I are exploring right now and I wanted to share this with you. We're also exploring the services of a financial advisory firm. There's a lot of financial advisory firms that are out there and we're currently using one. However, I want to look to see what other financial advisory firms are out there that have an instructional focus. No longer can we look at the house of our finances and our business operations without considering what sort of impact it may have on the instructional program. So we would be looking potentially, and this is something as I mentioned, the board and I are still considering, identifying a financial advisory firm that will pr provide us with a comprehensive financial analysis with an instructional program focus. This will provide us with an opportunity to look at our financial resources and how those financial resources can be used to enhance, to strengthen our instructional program. We would also be searching or seeking for them to assist us 
with the identification of a chief financial and business official. While <clears throat> there's been a number of individuals I've had conversations with, continuing the conversations, in fact, I'm going to be speaking with some people later this week who have expressed interest with helping us as a school district when it comes to our financial management. As superintendent, it is my responsibility to make sure that I'm bringing the best of the best. So I will be potentially looking at having a firm be able to identify individuals who may not know of our our small but beautiful community of Poughkeepsie and could share information with them so that they can say, hey, you know, this would be a wonderful place for me to relocate, similar to what my wife and I did through the assistance of the search firm that, that I went through to become superintendent. And then also, because professional development is important to every member of the school district, particularly if provided by experts, is to provide us with professional development and technical assistance. So I share all of this information with you so that as community members, as staff members, as students, that you have an understanding that when it comes to our business operations, this is paramount for us. As I mentioned earlier, the way I look at our financial resources, they really serve, just <clears throat> let me give you an analogy. <clears throat> if you have a car and you need to get from point A to point B, in order to get there, you need something that's going to fuel the car. Our business operations, our financial resources are what fuels our car. And in the event that we are taking the hose out of the car and the gas is just gushing, that's financial resources that could have gotten us further. So it's very important that when it comes to the management of our financial resources, that we're using our dollars as much or as effectively and as efficiently as possible to ultimately meet the needs of our children who we are here to serve on a day-to-day -day basis. So as I mentioned, <clears throat> these presentations will be periodic. I'm planning to have a presentation each month. And I invite the community to come, to hear, to learn, to be a part of the solution of turning our school district around. And I thank you for listening to my presentation, and this will be the first of many. Board colleagues, are there any questions for Dr. Rosser? What I would like to do now is to, um, to, to read, I would like to direct the attention of all community members to some correspondence that I had submitted. I will be reading it. Um, I'm, first, before I do that, I'm going to ask my board colleagues if, uh, if uh, you would mind that I read an email that I had sent you all privy to this email. Um, but um, I wanted to pull it so that the community is privy to this. This is from me, Felicia Watson, to uh, Ms. Tina Blama. She's a chief examiner with the Office of the State Comptroller. This email was sent to her. I had initially had a conversation with her. Uh, however, this email was sent on September 12, 2016 at 12.47 uh, p.m. And it reads, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, uh, Ms. Blama. As I mentioned, I'm a sitting board member of the Poughkeepsie City School District, elected by the citizens in 2015 for a three-year term. During this first year, 2015-16 school year, I have had numerous business office staff, district staff, and citizens at large contact me to discuss their experiences regarding grave impropriety and mismanagement of taxpayer dollars by school board members and administrators in the Poughkeepsie City School District. Attached for your initial review and preparation for our meeting are some of the areas where there are criminal and administrative impropriety experienced firsthand and reported to me. My intent in meeting with you tomorrow is to review these areas supported by evidence 
with the sole purpose of submitting an official report. And I just said, please confirm the receipt of this email. And there was an attachment that was filled. <clears throat> and then on September 21st, let's see, no, let's move. That was just a, a thank you to her for the meeting. It was a three hour meeting with the uh, chief examiner with the office of the state comptroller. <clears throat> and then on, let's see, this is, what's the date of this? It was in 2018. Yes, April 12, 2018. And this was again to uh, Ms. Blama, who's the chief examiner of the office of the state comptroller. And it reads, good afternoon, Tina. It's been almost two years since we met to discuss severe fiscal impropriety in the Poughkeepsie City School District. Since that time, I have continued to serve on the board and to learn more about my governor's role, especially around fiscal accountability. In 2017, two new board members, Doreen Clifford and Deborah Long, who won against the two longtime incumbents in a landslide victory, also expressed privately and during public board meetings contentions around fiscal impropriety and the district mismanagement of taxpayer dollars. Almost a year ago, the district hired a new assistant superintendent of finance and operations. After months of going through financial documents, she has concluded that there are numerous areas of improper spending and financial mismanagement, just as I presented to you during our September 13, 2016 discussion in your office following our areas she has uncovered and I list seven specific areas. <clears throat> the current superintendent of finance and operations has documentation from the previous assistant superintendent of finance and operations to the superintendent and board questioning some of the aforementioned items and blatantly stating that improper spending was occurring. The former assistant superintendent of finance and operations was recently interviewed by district legal counsel and shared this information. By the way, he was forced to resign in 2017 at the recommendation of the superintendent, but by the board under a no-fault termination clause in his contract. I did not support this unscrupulous termination. After receipt of this information, I also asked the assistant superintendent of business and, of business and finance and operations to request credit card statements for the past five years from the district credit card company because there have been numerous reports of past credit card mismanagement that has not been uncovered because the district does not have orderly statements for review. On April 4, 2018, I was CC'd on an email from Dennis Warren of the State Comptroller's New Windsor office that the Poughkeepsie City School District was selected to have an audit conducted. It is, imper it is imperative that this audit visit optimally uncovers and the report reflects these issues and all other areas of improper spending and district mismanagement of taxpayer dollars. And there's some other things that I said. And I share that because the impetus of this very thorough uh, audit that was conducted, it was over a year, uh, was predicated upon the board being privy to some of these practices and uncovering um, them and wanting them to be investigated by the Office of the State Comptroller, which it has been, and it has yielded this uh, recent report, which you are um, in receipt of and that you have access to as citizens. So I just wanted to share that. Are there any comments or, or questions from the board, from my board colleagues? At this time, we're going to move to our consent agenda. Are there any items to be removed from our consent agenda? 8.9. 11.2 and 11.3. 8.9, 11.2, 11.3. 8.6 is being pulled completely. One second. No, 8.6 is not being pulled. Mm -mm. Can you That's revisit that trustee Long? Is it? John Cassidy? Are there are there any other items to be removed? 8.9, 11.2, 11.3.
Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda, excluding items 8.9, 11.2, 11.3? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve agenda item 8.9? So moved. Discussion? Trustee Clifford? Um, I had asked um, via email Monday, I believe, whether or not um, this says B days. I was just curious what the status was of all the other days. Yeah, so this, for the sixth assignment, this was only for B day. Um, those day, other days were covered. Okay. Any further questions? All in favor of this uh, resolution being uh, approved? Aye. 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 Trustee uh, Long and Trustee Reeser? Aye. 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 None opposed, motion carries. Is there a motion to approve resolution number 11.2? So moved. Can we discuss 11.2 and 11.3? Together. Together. Is there a motion to approve resolutions number 11.2, 11.3? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion, Trustee Clifford. Um, a couple of things. The first is, um, I just wanted to, I just wanted this discussed um, openly because, again, I emailed my question. Um, but this is the first time that I had ever seen on a board agenda recommendation from from someone other than the superintendent. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to, uh, and, it, and it was ex explained to me, but I wanted to pull it because I thought it would be um, beneficial to explain it so the public understands why this is coming from an assistant soup and not from a superintendent. Okay. Yeah, as I mentioned, and I'm not certain, we may need to amend this, mm -hmm. um, Ms. Torres. Yes. Um, it should not read this way. It was a recommendation coming from the assistant superintendent for athletics as it relates to overseeing the RFP process. And that was a recommendation that was coming to me for the purposes of the board record. That is not necessary. So that should be struck from the, the actual um, board recommendation because it's my recommendation based upon the recommendation that I received from my staff member. Is there a motion to amend this resolution, um, resolution number 11.2, to read, be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the appointment of orthopedic associates of Dutchess County PC to provide athletic training, sports medicine services for the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year in response to the RFP athletic training, sports medicine at a rate of $30,000 based on the recommendation, recommendation of the superintendent of schools? So, so moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve 11.3 as, as read? 11.2 as read? 11.3. Oh. Okay. No. Back second. Back. Let's go back to 11.2 to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 11.2 as read. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So the amended uh, resolution was approved. Is there a motion to approve uh, uh, agenda item 11.3? So moved. All in favor? Wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I need one. I, there's discussion I have about 11.3. Okay, 11. That's why I pulled them together because this is also the first time, and I, I don't recall this being this way when board docs went live, um, or I would have, I think I would have noticed it then. But I don't ever, this is the first time that I'm seeing us approving the appointment and then separately approving the agreement. Or do we usually approve the appointment like at one meeting and approve the agreement at another meeting? There, there's no, in, in, in any meeting, it is, it is up to the board to do whatever we so choose. And so it has been proposed and recommended by the superintendent in this way. There is no um, carte blanche anything when it comes to resolution. So the superintendent has put forth this way. If, there is, um, if the board is not in favor of doing it this way, then that's something that should be discussed. If not, then uh, we should move forward with it. No, I don't. I just, again, it's it's something. It's it's um, an it's uh, an anomaly. An anomaly. Right. Um, so and uh, so I. Yeah, I can speak to just it. To so be clear. this is the organization that provides athletic trainers mm -hmm. at our sporting events, and what we wanted to do with this is to make sure that at our home games, that our students were provided with the. Um, 
with the athletic trainers that they have mm -hmm. been accustomed to, to being provided with. There's nothing legal that indicates that we need to have the athletic trainers, but mm -hmm. in our community, we have always provided yes. this. Um, here to four, prior to this RFP process being completed, you know, we have had the appropriate staff members there to provide support to our children but not to belabor, you know, the start of these individuals. You know, we went through the RFP process. You know, Mr. Hodge made the recommendation that this organization had um, officially um, won the actual bid, and I asked Mr. Hodge to make sure that he also secures a contract so that I wouldn't wait until January 22nd right. to then have the board approve the contract, yep. which would then yes. take us even longer yep. before we can have an athletic training. Gotcha. Thank you. Trustee Clifford, are there any further questions nope. specific to that? No, thank you. That's Other board it. members, thank are there you. questions specific to 11.3? <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Let's move to uh, consent or action items, Board of Education. There are two action, there are three action items. Is there a motion to approve agenda item 13.1? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve agenda item 13.2? <coughs> so moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve agenda <coughs> item 13.3? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. That concludes our agenda items. We're going to move into our comments by our uh, superintendent of schools, Dr. Eric Rosser, followed by Dr. Andrew Reeser, then uh, Trustee Doreen Clifford, Trustee Michelle martinez Lefford, and, and Vice President uh, Deborah Long. So I want to sort of um, thank everyone for being here this evening. I also want to share with you that on January 22nd, at our next board meeting, which will be held at City Hall, I will be providing a report on the surveys and my first um, sort of overview of the district, meaning you know what I've seen in the first 100 days of me being on board. I hope that everyone can be a part of that because there's some, been some very good information that I have gleaned from the surveys that I will be presenting on for our community to, to, to understand the, the perceptions and the desires of moving the Poughkeepsie City School District in a new direction. I also want to sort of share with everyone that um, we have a number of individuals who have indicated that they will be retiring at the end of the school year, and I want to acknowledge them for their service. We have John Cassidy, who is a math teacher here at Poughkeepsie High School, who at the end of June will have given 30 years of service to the Poughkeepsie High School. So I wanted to publicly acknowledge and to thank Mr. Cassidy for his service to the children of the Poughkeepsie City School. Additional, we, additionally, we have Lena Valdez, elementary teacher at PMS, and actually I should say middle school teacher at PMS, who is, um, have given 31 years of service as of June 2020. We want to thank her for her service in the school district. I do have some sad news. We have one memorial, um, and I would like to read it. Whereas Charlotte Stern served in the Poughkeepsie City School District as an English ESL teacher for 31 years prior to her death on December 4th, 2019. Be it resolved that the Poughkeepsie City School District Board of Education and Administration staff extend their sincere condolences to Ms. Stern's family and friends and join them in honoring her memory. If we can just take a moment just to pause in silence in remembrance of Ms. Stern's. Thank you, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Dr. Rosser. Dr. Reeser. Uh, thank you, Madam Board President. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rosser uh, for that uh, systematic look um, at our uh, past mistakes, um, our ongoing imperfections, uh, and the steps we're taking to address them. 
Uh, it takes courage to, to look in the mirror uh, self-critically, um, and I want to thank you for helping us do that. Um, that, that was uh, illuminating, um, inspiring, uh, sobering, uh, all, all those things, but inspiring too. Um, congratulations on the progress you've made so far, uh, just in your short time uh, as superintendent to, to make progress in addressing them. Um, it's inspiring me a little bit to uh, put my shoulders to the wheel as board, individual board members and collectively we have re responsibilities. Uh, one that I uh, have been offered and want to do better, a better job at doing uh, is helping uh, to work on policy. You know, we've been talking as a, as a board about our need to review that, that stack that you mentioned, that you know, thousand pages, uh, to make sure that our policies are up to date uh, and that we're in compliance with them or updating the policy to, to reflect current practice, et cetera. And that's something where I feel I can help and in, in, in your presentation here inspires me to do a better job of that. Uh, and that's something that my New Year's resolution uh, as a board member uh, is to, um, is to, to help uh, the board and help the district um, uh, in, in that area uh, through our policy committee, uh, which we really do need to uh, move forward with. So thank you for uh, lighting a fire under me. And yes, I'm using that fire metaphor intentionally. It makes me feel <laughs> a little warm. Just mentioning fire is helping me a little bit because it's freezing. Um, quick, quick thing, I, I know we're getting to get the end here. A quick thing, um, this is time sensitive. I wanted, wanted to bring it to the attention of um, central office uh, building leadership if, if you're, you're here. Um, so it, came to, it comes to my attention from Ken Steyer, who's a friend, a community um, volunteer uh, and city resident, that the State Office of uh, Division of Historic Preservation has offered a free service. Uh, they have a, um, uh, a, an exhibition, uh, which they can provide to us at, at no cost. It's entitled Journey to the North, New York's Freedom Trail. Uh, it uh, is a, a multi-panel ex exhibit about uh, New York State's role in the Underground Railroad. Uh, and it's, it's been um, prepared uh, in time for uh, Black History Month, which is obviously coming up in, in, in February. Uh, the uh, Office of Historic Preservation uh, would be willing to work with someone in, in Poughkeepsie. Um, the district, there are other options besides the district, right? I mean, it could go uh, the, the city or some of the local colleges could then provide atrium or lobby space for this exhibit to be then open to the public and, and be used for, uh, uh, for, for the benefit of, of all uh, residents of the city. But it'll also be a, uh, a teaching and learning tool um, for social studies teachers, history teachers, and their sequences, uh, probably more likely at the middle school and high school. So I thought I would um, bring this to your attention. Uh, if you're listening, uh, if you're a building leader, a principal, maybe a teacher, um, in, 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 in central office staff, et cetera, uh, uh, and this sounds interesting to you, um, let me know, and I can put you in contact with those that could could make this happen. Um, so, uh, just an opportunity that I thought I would uh, get out there in this in this public forum. Uh, and that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question, which is uh, we have been meeting um, pretty systematically here at the high school since uh, Bolin has been closed, and during these winter months, it has always been cold here in the auditorium. Um, and our last meeting was at the middle school, and it was hot, <clears throat> to say the least. So I'm wondering why we keep meeting here when it's so cold, um, when we have other buildings that perhaps we could be meeting at. <laughs> I just want to throw it out there. You don't have to respond. It's a rhetorical question. Um, no, but I'm we're serious. To, I will I'm be serious. No, I will be addressing that when, okay. I, when I speak. So hang tight. Yeah, all right. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you, poor colleague. I'll, I'll try not to get frostbite by then. Yeah. Um, let, me just, let me just say that hopefully City Hall doesn't have these challenges. So our next meeting, as I mentioned before, this is a shameless plug, will be January 22nd when I will be giving my report on the strategic planning process. So at least for January 22nd, we should have a nice warm home. The, the other thing though, I, you know, I was being a bit facetious, but also serious, but on a, on a more serious level, um, I do realize, um, you know, for, for instance, I work in another school district and at four o'clock, the, the, the 
the timers on the thermostats go down and the heat starts to drop in all of the buildings, and I understand the need to conserve energy. Um, and I would imagine that perhaps that's something that we do here in the district. My concern is, is this an evening time problem or are our students sitting in this auditorium with it this cold during the day? That, that you know, we can sit through a meeting for three hours and have cold knees and ears, but if our students are sitting with this every day during the school hour, that, that's completely right, inappropriate. Right. And our students are indicating that it is cold in here, so I will most certainly have the um, facilities team look into this. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank, Thank you, you, Trustee Clifford. Thanks. So I just wanted to wish everybody a happy new year. Um, so Trustee Clifford, in my building at 10 a.m., the boilers turn off. So it's cold by the end of the school day. Yeah, it, it gets pretty chilly. Um, and I, I have a couple quick comments. They're just some things that I've uh, heard from other parents in the district. Um, and these are, so one of them is specific to um, progress reports that are sent out to, and I know I made a statement, a similar statement a few months ago, but progress reports that are sent out home, um, parents are telling me that when they're receiving their child's progress report, that there are sometimes um, certain uh, teachers that are omitting um, information about their child. So they're not able to actually see the progress of their children in all of their classes. It's only some classes. Um, and so parents have come to me and say that that's frustrating because they want to know about all their classes, not just a few. Um, <clears throat> Another concern that I have is parents being provided the proper information um, from 504 and IEP meetings, so CSE meetings, being delivered the um, copy of the information that was discussed in CSE meetings um, in a timely manner, not six months later. Uh, and that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Can I just piggyback on that? Because, Michelle, you reminded me of something. Have the state assessment scores been provided to... Um, they have been. To yes. parents? I know they have been. I believe they have. I'm not sure. Dr. Tendike, has the state assessment scores been provided to parents? Yeah, I So what if you I didn't know, attend parent that. teacher conference? Okay. 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 Something that we can we I will. We need to because as a as a I, I, will. I didn't get ELA state assessment scores. Let's just put it that way. I will say that um, if any of you know me, I, there was a few years ago, I kept coming to the mic before I was a board member about um, receiving the state test scores on time as well as AIS being provided to students and being notified by the district that students needed to be provided um, AIS services or academic inter intervention services um, based on their test scores and then other data provided by classroom teachers. And I will say that this was the first year that I actually did receive notification um, for my own child to, that will be receiving AIS in, um, her school, during her school day. Thank you, Trustee martinez left for Trustee uh, Long. Um, I just have a couple of things. I want to thank the parents and the caregivers and the guardians um, who have called me in the last couple of days. Um, one real concern, um, Dr. Rosser, there is no nurse at the middle school. Is that accurate? Mr. Hodge? And Ms. Barden as well. Can you well repeat as, the statement, sir? Okay. So we did get word that the full-time nurse at the middle school did resign. And we've been working with HR. They're actually postings now. Ms. Barden has been working to um, get assistance. She's actually been going over there and covering herself. So we have been covering the middle school. And hopefully here in the next, we, we actually talked about it today, Ms. Ms. Barton and myself, hopefully we are going to be able to get some candidates. We did, I personally interviewed three candidates. Um, 
and we're still in process with that. So hopefully we'll have that done here very shortly. I think that would be a sense of urgency. So I oh, had a, yeah, we've been working so on it. I had it. a parent reach out to yep. me whose child had a seizure and an mm -hmm. hour had passed and no one knew anything. That's very concerning. Um, right. So I wanted to speak to it and, yeah. me and mention it on the floor. But this has been on, it's been on our radars for like the last three weeks. Okay. Um, and whenever there's a student that has a medical um, event, you know, our staff members are fully aware that if we're unable to handle it as a staff, that they are to call the emergency medical services. So I I'm not certain if that was the, there was an event that took place um, just the other day mm -hmm. where a student had a seizure and I was alerted by staff that EMS was contacted to address that student's um, individual concern. Right, after some time lapse, okay. And then my second concern is I was at the game last night. I had several people con uh, confront me about the schedules not being posted on the website. Um, so mm -hmm. they would love to support our students in all aspects of every uh, sport, but we don't know or they don't know when they're playing. So the, so the schedules were on the athletic page. We use um, section one has a platform for schedules, it's called Sports Pack. And all you do is you go on Sports Pack, you click on Poughkeepsie, you click on the sport, and it automatically, real time, has all our home games and away games. Do we have paper say schedules for those who can't yes. access the internet? So, say that again? Do we have hard copies for those who can't access the yeah. internet? Oh yes, we have hard copies in my office for people that can't access that. And we actually just, just change it as you can see on the on here on the on the front page. We're moving this to the front page of the um, website, and the reason why this sports pack is a it's great. It's actually a free service for all schools in the section, because as you know, games change daily due to weather. It could be um, school closings, and any time that there's a change, it automatically changes to this. So this is like a real time um, calendar for all of our events. Mr. Hodge, if you can make sure that all of our, particularly our yeah. middle school and our high schools, that they have ample copies of the hard copy schedule yes. with the notation on it that the dates and times may change due to unforeseen circumstances. Yep. We put that on the calendar. Okay. Because I actually have a, um, a media company and it, they actually haven't come in yet. It's like those poster style yeah. ones that you see. Um, he actually just called me today to apologize that they didn't get here yet. But on that, it actually says on there, subject to change. Okay. And we get those to every building in the district. So if they could put, again, on the, on the table where we actually come in and pay, I think that would actually. Oh, yeah. People They'll would, be there. People yep. would love that. Um, and I just want to say Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I would like to also say thank you, Trustee Clifford, the location to be changed. I am freezing. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if I can walk out of here. My feet, I don't, can't even feel them. And um, that's all I have to say. So on behalf of the Board of Education, I do want to apologize for the heating situation. I, I don't know what's going on here, but, but it is unacceptable. And on behalf of the Board, I totally apologize to our community, to all those that are sitting here. And I, we super appreciate you hanging tight. I'm just going to uh, try and quickly get through uh, a couple of these things. So as I stated, uh, one of the things that um, Dr. Rosser and the Board Clerk uh, initially had spoken about, and then, um, and then I uh, spoke with the Board Clerk about this, is changing the location of the meeting. Uh, not just because of the cold, but it's just this, a huge room and, and, um, and um, we were looking at PACE. As you know, Central Administration has relocated to PACE. Um, there may be some other constraints, and I know Dr. Roster is trying to uh, work on those, but uh, the, the board we're going to ask that we consider moving to PACE. Um, the, uh, the, the board clerk, uh, Ms. Torres, she has some pictures she's going to send over to us. They have a gymnasium which has a stage and um, and, um, and they're, they're looking at, I know Dr. Rosser, I don't know some of the nuances. I know you did a walkthrough with the board clerk, but um, that is something that has been considered. I, I do want to just, as to confirm, I know that uh, um, Dr. Rosser mentioned the January 22nd meeting. However, I need board approval for the relocation because the, um, the uh, meetings that are on our calendar are, 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 are legitimate in there. And there has been a change um, 
to, to move the meeting to the, a, re, a recommendation to move the meeting to uh, City Hall on January 22nd. And I just want to make sure that no uh, board that there's a board majority that's in a, in, in um, support of that move. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Rosser and, and, and Becky, I'm going to ask you to please con con to continue to to look at the uh, pay site. And then if you could let the board know if that's um, where we would be looking to move for the meeting after the January 22nd meeting um, and, uh, and moving forward with that. Um, there's just a couple things I just want to do. There, the website has been updated. Please take a look at the website and weigh in. Um, any suggestions that you have? Some of you um, look at the website daily, uh, Mr. Stanford. So <laughs> please, um, please uh, uh, give any input to that. Um, there will be a board retreat, and I'm just throwing this out as information. I'm not sure if, if we're going to open up as a, a regular meeting, but a board retreat on January 27th. Uh, the the uh, board clerk is in the throes of, of securing the location. We believe it's going to be at Marist College. Um, it'll just be for a couple of hours just for us to continue to solidify ourselves as, an, as an, um, a board. As you're aware, the board are five members, and we, we are as one entity, though. No individual board member by policy has any authority except that which is designated and delegated by board policy. So the board is one entity. Um, this is for the board member, the board. So a wonderful thing has happened. The, the Poughkeepsie Public Schools Foundation has revitalized. I'm not going to the, go, go into the details. I probably would have if it weren't so cold in here. But they're doing a phenomenal job. They're just committed individuals that have a passion for the district and they volunteer their time, their energy, and they push for their, their own personal finances and they're pushing for finances of others to support the school district. If there are any members of the Poughkeepsie Fan Foundation, your feet may be cold, so if you can just wave your hands in the air, wave it like you just don't care, great, thank you. So let's just give them a hand. They, they, I, I'm telling you, it's such an impressive foundation and they're, they're beginning to do um, wonderful, wonderful things. Um, there's two things, Dr. Rosser. So EPK, um, we have Healthy Kids, which is right over here on Hooker Avenue. They, um, they have a, a young mom's program, Healthy Kids program, and they uh, wanted to, um, they reached out to the school district, high school young moms, to assist getting them to graduate. The center is at 103 Hooker Ave. They have a few slots left for infant toddlers and it has always been a passion of mine, this is the individual standard, to work with young moms to encourage them to return to school and graduate. There's a child care subsidy that will cover the tuition costs associated as long as the mom is attending the Poughkeepsie High School. So if we know of individuals, Dr. Rasha, I don't know who should receive this, but we need to get this to someone. And then EPK funding, the same organization, Healthy Kids, is um, they're interested in collaborating on a grant um, it's a pre -K, uh, expanded pre-K grant through the New York State Education Department. The RFP is expected to be released this summer of 2020. It's a beautiful thing uh, when organizations are looked to align with the Poughkeepsie City School District and to provide support, services, and to collaborate. So, um, Dr. Ross, I'm going to leave this also with you for you to perhaps reach out or give it to a designated individual um, so that we can perhaps um, let them know what, what we can do. I do have a question specific to the school tax collector because um, can, where are they housed? Where is this individual housed? Because I know that there's been individuals that have not been able to, to pay their taxes. Pace. Okay, they are housed at PACE. Are there specific hours? Yeah, there's been a change also. And um, Ms. Torres, you may be able to speak a little bit more in depth on this than I can. But there's been a change. I know that after a certain time period that we no longer accept taxes okay. at Central Off at PACE, that there is a, another destination where individuals will need to then pay their taxes. Okay, so I think if we can get, since the, the uh, website is being um, updated. updated, if we could put that information in a really clear place um, for them, because I know that, um, one, we need all the, 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 the dollars. We want, folks want to pay their taxes because when, if they don't pay them, they can be penalized for paying them late, and we don't want that to be uh, the onus to be on us. Um, finally, Dr. Ross, I, I wanted, um, if you wouldn't mind, to give to the board an update on the bus transportation. We know it is cold in, in the city. The temperature has dropped substantially this evening. 
Um, have we, do we have any update as far as use of the bus? Do we have sufficient buses so that our young people uh, can be picked up? I know I got a call this morning. Um, there, was a, there were a lot of kids on the corner of Montgomery and, let's see, Montgomery and the intersection over there by the fountain, the soldiers fountain area mm -hmm. somewhere over there. And we want to make sure that sufficient buses are in place to, to, to pick up our students. Yeah, whenever there are um, concerns or, or questions about, you know, what our students are able to, to take, you know, those questions are usually forwarded directly to our contacts at the county office. Mm -hmm. I will share with you that we met with them last month towards the end of um, probably the, it may have been December 16th, if I remember correctly. We met with them and we talked to them about, you know, our students being able to take the buses because word that individuals have shared with me that sometimes buses are passing students up. Um, individuals share it with me that sometimes buses aren't coming on time. Mm -hmm. So whenever I receive that information, I do share it with our county um, partners and they make adjustments where needed. Um, what was shared with me is that sometimes our middle and our high school students are seeking to catch a bus where there's not a, a bus stop. They mm -hmm. may see the bus coming, the bus may, they may be walking and the bus stop is way up there and they'll try to flag the bus down, but the busing and the way that the laws are written is that they have to only stop at bus stops. Okay. They can't pick our students up elsewhere. In the event that the bus is full, then there's another bus that is usually trailing that bus mm -hmm. no more than 10 to 15 minutes after that. So okay. there's normally two buses that run um, 10 to 15 minutes apart. If we can continue to ensure that our students and their parents or guardians are aware of this information, if we can post it on our website, if we can continue to disseminate it, especially with this cold weather, uh, that would be great. And I um, will say under the leadership of um, Deron Wilson, um, he has created a flyer which has been posted in our middle and our high schools so that many more of our students are aware of this free service. And I know the PIG students are over here. You guys should all be aware that by showing your ID on you can actually access the bus to and from school. If you want to, let's say we're playing um, another school, let's say we're playing Arlington in basketball, that you're actually able to take your bus pass, excuse me, your ID pass and go to the game by catching the, the county transportation. That's a free service that is offered to Poughkeepsie Middle School and High School students. Thank you, sir. Uh, a couple other things, too, for the board. How many of you knew that? Raise your hand, please. Yeah, some, not all. Well, we're going to continue uh, to get Thank the information you. out. And, uh, and as uh, Dr. Ross said, Deron Wilson has um, been tasked with that to continue to disseminate that information. Um, on behalf of, to, for the board, I, I have a, a request that on behalf of the board, I would like to send uh, letters of congratulations to the Common Council members, uh, those who were newly elected, and to the... Um, to the uh, county legislator just as we continue to collaborate and to build a strong partnership within the community. Is any, do we have a majority uh, yes. in support of that? Yes. Okay, and um, I should have discussed that in the executive session. Okay, that's pretty much it. Uh, Happy New Year to each and every one of you. Thank you so very much for being here. Again, we apologize for the heat situation. Please get home safely. Is there a motion to adjourn out of this regular board meeting on Wednesday, January 8th? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Again, thank you so very much.